On today's World Insight with Tian Wei, Qualcomm falls short of its $44 billion bid to acquire NXP. What's next? And Chinese economist Li Daokui spells out the Chinese plan for economic reform. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. We begin today with Qualcomm's scrapped $44 billion deal with NXP. U.S.-based Qualcomm abandoned last week what would have been the world's biggest ever semiconductor sector takeover after the deadline passed without the deal winning China's approval. The Chinese government said the issue was related to anti-monopoly law enforcement. Let's take a look at the latest. A bid for a merger abandoned after a two-year wait. American chipmaker Qualcomm dropped its acquisition of Dutch-based NXP semiconductors after the deadline for the transaction, which needed China's support, passed last Thursday. The Ministry of Commerce said China's decision to not extend support for the multi-billion dollar deal was not a result of trade tensions with the U.S. The Chinese Foreign Ministry clarified it was about anti-monopoly law enforcement. China's relevance department examined Qualcomm's acquisition of NXP according to the provisions of anti-monopoly law. During the examination process, China's relevance department has maintained good communication with Qualcomm. China's State Administration for Market Regulation said in a statement on Friday that proposals put forth by the firm to resolve antitrust concerns were insufficient, but it hoped to continue communicating with Qualcomm. Chinese regulators set the antitrust review period to August 15, with an extended deadline of October 14. Qualcomm's proposed $44 billion merger was first announced in October 2016, aimed at the broader array of products, including sensors and microprocessors for smart devices. In the past months, the acquisition had received antitrust clearance from eight of the nine required government regulatory bodies around the world while awaiting China's approval. The latest approval came from the EU at the beginning of the year. The San Diego wireless pioneer had extended the deadline several times before. The final date was July 26. Since the deadline passed without China's support, Qualcomm eventually dropped the deal and paid NXP $2 billion in termination fees, as agreed before. For more on the effects of China-U.S. trade tensions on mergers and acquisitions, whether it has to do or not with the Qualcomm issue, we are joined in our Beijing studio, Professor Zhang Gong from the University of International Business and Economics. Also in Beijing, we have from the Red Pagoda Resources, Andy Mock. Thank you for being with us. In New York, we have Max Wolf. Professor of Economics from New School University. Gentlemen, I want to welcome to the three of you. Let me ask you first, uh, Professor Wolf, about your reaction to the failure this time that Qualcomm uh, be able to acquire an XP. Yeah, so look, we've seen a lot of tr various trade tensions and recriminations. Not clear exactly what was the cause here. There are a couple of possibilities. And it looks like, al although there's been some sort of somewhat raising the flag for uh, conflict around the world, it doesn't look like there was an outright rejection as much as the time ran out here. And clearly there are some legitimate concerns about concentration in the market. Right. If you look at the mobile phone space, it is heavily dominated by basically Qualcomm and Intel. And there's some evidence that we'd all be better off with a little bit more of a competitive landscape. And major mergers reduce, not increase, the competitive landscape. All right. At the Chinese side, has extended the deadline for the final decision coming from the Chinese government to the end of October, uh, Andy. And, of course, as a result of this, Qualcomm believes it could not extend further its work about an acquisition of an XP. Mm -hmm. The Chinese is saying this is about anti-monopoly law, just as Professor Wolf just mentioned at the end of his answer. Andy, your thought? Well, uh, 
Qualcomm, of course, is a publicly traded company. It's worth about 90 billion U.S. dollars. Its main market has been in smartphones, which has grown 30, 40, 50 percent a year. The five-year projection is 3.8 percent. So they have to find growth. So that's the first issue. The second is investors hate uncertainty. So no one knows what the future of Qualcomm is going to be if this acquisition closes or not. So I think they had to make a decision, mm. and they said, enough is enough. We'll pay our $2 billion. We will move on. Mm. And by the way, they have a lot of zigzagging. If we could take a look at what happened earlier, not just this deal, but the earlier deal. Mm -hmm. Earlier in March, President Trump blocked a $117 billion bid for chip maker Qualcomm. The buyer was Broadcom, a Singapore-based tech company. Mr. Trump believed then the deal would allow Broadcom to acquire control of Qualcomm and it could threaten U.S. national security. According to New York Times reports, though Broadcom is based in Singapore, China was the main concern that drove Mr. Trump's decision over the Qualcomm deal because allowing an American technology company to be acquired would cede its primacy in the semiconductor and wireless industry. So this is very interesting in a way. Uh, Professor Gong, I want to go to you with a comparison between these two decisions. Okay. Well, One is, we mentioned to our viewers, because it's very important for them to know the whole landscape. One is the Chinese government for now mm -hmm. to delay the final decision about whether to allow or not mm -hmm. the Qualcomm deal with NXP mm -hmm. based on anti-monopoly concerns. Mm -hmm. The other one mm -hmm. is the earlier deal, mm -hmm. the so-called hostile bid mm -hmm. coming from Broadcom, mm -hmm. which is a Singapore-based company, mm -hmm. to acquire Qualcomm, mm -hmm. and eventually based on national security issue right. by CBS, by the Trump administration, mm -hmm. that hostile bid did not happen. Right. How should we in a way compare these two cases. This uh, is very interesting. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, the nature of these two cases are quite different. The first case, as you mentioned, is an anti-monopoly case. You know, Qualcomm has a, a, a market, a lot of market power in the, in the, in the cell phone uh, uh, chip business. Um, the NXP is actually the former free scale part of Motorola company. And this is actually a, mo a, 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 it's a, a chip company for making um, uh, devices in cars. Mm. So they are actually quite uh, have a lot of market power in the automobile business, electronics and automobile business. Okay. So the combination of these two poses, uh, according to the uh, Minister of Commerce uh, uh, and, a, and a Trust Bureau, I think in their mind this poses the possibility of a anti-monopoly concern. I think that's the um, that's where they're coming from. But that doesn't mean they're going to block this deal. They're mm. just saying they need some further time to investigate this, to get some more data, to do some more analysis. And to the end of October. Uh, and extend to the end of October. And of course, you know, Qualcomm said is they, they, they don't think it's going to go through and they will drop. Okay. Right. Now, the, 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 the Qualcomm case in the U.S. Uh, is, is an entirely different case. It's, ba it's, it's going through the CFIS process. It's, it's uh, based on national security arguments. It is actually very different. And my opinion about this deal is that, first of all, you know, I, I, I don't understand why you know, they think that the uh, uh, Broadcom is, is coming from China. Broadcom is, is clearly, it used to be an American company, by the way. It's actually acquired later by Brock K, which is based in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So now it's becoming a Singaporean company. Um, this is the first thing. The second thing is that, um, the, 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 the second thing is that the, 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 this idea about, you know, the, the chip company being acquired by a, it's actually not even a Chinese company, right? It's, 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 it's a Singapore company. Why this poses a national security concern? That just baffles me. You know, I think mm -hmm. uh, the timing probably, you know, it, so it if that is the case, probably that means Qualcomm will never be acquired by anyone from outside the United States if it's a national security concern. I think concern. if that's the case, if that, I think that's clearly Trump's uh, position on this. And and I think the even before uh, this time is not very 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 right. I think because the the CFIS process itself is subject to a lot of prism anyway. Before this is interesting <laughs> too. Uh, important point just to explain to our viewers, mm -hmm. uh, those who know how CPS work, which is a quasi-government you know, organization right. that is uh, looking through the deals, particularly acquisitions of American companies, mm -hmm. to see whether it is going against the so-called national security right. interests uh, mm -hmm. of the United States. But that usually is done when a deal is made by those that are 
uh, going to acquire and mm -hmm. the one that is going to be acquired. Mm -hmm. And yet this time, mm -hmm. when Broadcom mm -hmm. tried to start a hostile bid against Qualcomm, mm -hmm. the deal was not made. Right. But Qualcomm <coughs> already pushed it mm -hmm. to CVS, mm -hmm. knowing there is a possibility mm -hmm. that it would rule against it mm -hmm. as a result of so-called national security concern. Mm -hmm. Professor Wolf, that to us is an interesting issue because that means there are enormous amount of loopholes in the work of CBS. In this case alone, for example, it is not following the procedure as to what qualified for a CBS uh, decision. What is not, right? Yeah, yeah, so the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., which is what creates the acronym CFIUS that we're using here, is really designed to make sure that we're not selling the vital infrastructure that we need for our, to defend our sovereignty. And that historically has generally been narrowly interpreted to only mean that there may be certain vital activities that any state or the U.S. state has to retain in domestic hands in order to be under some sort of supervisory authority of the U.S. government, particularly in a time of conflict or, or war, mm. but it's, it's traditionally been sort of narrowly defined. What I think much more disturbing to me and some of my colleagues is the following. If the United States couldn't possibly risk its national security by allowing a foreign company to own the company that makes all the chips in its cell phone, how can we ask everyone else on earth to risk their national security by buying the chips from this company that's American? Mm -hmm. So this is actually potentially a direct attack on international free trade. Just looks like a national security decision made by that committee right now. And that's mm -hmm. much more troubling and potentially impactful to the global order than the particular deal being discussed right now between Broadcom and Qualcomm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, your explanation. Further than that, um, Andy, that is, what about Qualcomm? Apparently, it used a very convenient tool of politics mm -hmm. and involving the government going through the CPS process to so-called save itself, even though it's not, its investors is not very happy about that because they lose mm -hmm. a lot of money mm -hmm. if they uh, are not being acquired by Qualcomm. Uh, having said that, though, what? does it serve, whether it really serves the interests of Qualcomm fundamentally, it's a big question, isn't it? When you have businesses letting politics playing a major role about its future fate, what do you make of that? Well, you know, I think, um, first of all, any global corporation can't not be involved in politics and use politics as one tool. But then again, live by the sword, die by the sword, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think it's important also to recognize here that um, Qualcomm made actually, I think, a very interesting argument. Uh, the reason it's a national security issue, while they didn't follow the formal protocol for the CFIUS review, mm -hmm. you know, after the transaction right. was done. Um, but the argument, as I understand it, is that 5G is critical to the U.S.'s future and to China's future. Qualcomm is the national champion for the United States. I mean, we don't have this formal concept of national champion. Uh, Huawei is the Chinese champion. Mm. And by letting Broadcom acquire uh, Qualcomm, there was the fear, at least the argument was made, that it would slow down the pace of R&D mm -hmm. to boost the short-term share price, the earnings per quarter of the combined entity. So that was the rationale why, why that was used. Why is that rationale? Is that what is trying to suggest that Broadcom is trying to slow down the 5G development of Qualcomm and therefore it cannot be acquired by Broadcom? No, so the argument is this. I mean, it's a very much a capital markets argument, which means that what Broadcom would do after they acquired Qualcomm mm -hmm. was reduce R&D spending, which is an expense. Got it. Would in increase the profits and therefore the share price. So it's good for the short term. It's bad for the entity in the long run because then they might lose their chance to establish global leadership in 5G. Mm -hmm. It's a loss from the American Country, national perspective because now the, the logic is that if the U.S. does not lead 5G, we're in trouble. Right. Professor Wolf, that's certainly an interesting ar counter argument coming from Qualcomm as uh, being illustrated by Andy earlier, but that also has a huge loophole there, which is a company is trying to tell the government what the interests of the national security is and let the government decide about this case. And meanwhile, how a company would choose 
its future direction of research and development or businesses is totally should be in the interest of that company and that company alone. So there are a lot of intertwined politics coming into the decision making of a company apparently. Uh, and if that is so, who will be able to do business with Qualcomm anymore knowing that there is the potential that the government could be involved at any time on anything? Yeah, so I think there'll be some concerns. I think we should keep in mind that particularly the Snapdragon, the line of high-end processors for cellular telephony in, in our smartphones, that, that uh, basically this company, Qualcomm, has a global dominance position. Yeah. And the Android phones, which are about 83% of market share and dominate outside the U.S., where iOS, the Apple product, is a bit larger market share than in most places, they've done pretty well. I don't anticipate people stopping to use them. I think maybe the problem with the argument, although I also agree it's an interesting one, is that letting American companies be in charge of their own R&D has not been particularly the source of American strength in all cases when it comes to cellular telephony. A lot of the early technology was developed by the U.S. government. Some was developed by Motorola that then ceased to exist, went, sort of blew up, and we've become, un unfortunately in the United States, a laggard in our cellular telephony and Wi-Fi infrastructure, even though we invented it, so we fell quickly behind other countries uh, without any foreign ownership of our companies. So uh, unfortunately, what we're afraid foreigners might do to us in the future, we've largely done to ourselves. So while I think it's an interesting argument, I'm not sure that the factual analysis of the recent history bears out that we've correctly identified uh, where the risk flows from and mm -hmm. where the s sort of salvation lies I in, in terms of uh, what makes for the best cellular telephony infrastructure in the U.S. Okay, got it. Uh, Professor Gong, mm -hmm. what about that point I just raised mm -hmm. to see companies having politics mm -hmm. come in, right. temporarily <laughs> save its so-called lives, mm -hmm. but eventually could backfire? Well, I think, you know, the, I, I, I don't have a lot of detailed information about what actually Qualcomm did. We do not know. Yeah, we only yeah. know the public information. That's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. But, but, but regardless, I think that uh, this deal would have been blocked anyway by Donald Trump because you know, he has been criticizing uh, CFIS and particularly the, the CFIS issue involving um, the telecom industry. Telecom always holds a very special position in, in, in national infrastructure. So it's very sensitive uh, as manifested in decisions on you know, Huawei products, on, uh, ZTE products in mm -hmm. the U.S., uh, let alone this is a chip product. It's the very heart of the, of the smartphone. So I think, you know, the, in, in that context, context, uh, in my opinion, is that uh, this deal you know, would have been blocked anyway by, by Donald Trump because he's just trying to pick up somebody, some company, as an example to show that he's tough on national security. Mm -hmm. I mean, Donald Trump has a very extensive interpretation of national security. It's interesting that this issue is actually was brought up in the Section 232 uh, investigation with mm -hmm. respect to steel and aluminum. Steel and aluminum could be an issue of national security. And he is about to raise the issue of uh, German imports of uh, automobiles. That's also potentially another national security in uh, interest. You know, the, the national security issue is, is just a very strange history in, in, at WTO. For example, Sweden at one time raised the issue of making shoes as a national security mm -hmm. issue. So the, all these, uh, Kushinov has a very famous saying, zippers has a national security mm -hmm. issue. Because, well, know, there could the, be a national security <laughs> issue, issue yeah. by the way. So, but I think uh, Donald Trump totally bought into this. And, uh, you know, he has a very extensive interpretation, expansive ex interpretation of uh, national interest. Right. <clears throat> we talk about the Qualcomm. This is only one of those case studies. Uh, in which we try to analyze the relationship between politics and company and how companies would work under a globalized system. If we take a look at this example, once again, Qualcomm has been the chip provider to major smartphone makers around the world, including some from China. Take China ZTE, for instance. It sold over 46 million smartphones globally in the year 2017, with half of them powered by Qualcomm's Snapdragon. However, competitors are growing for Qualcomm. Domestically, Apple has been working hard on developing its own chip. We all know how Apple works. It wants to have a, something of its own on everything. Internationally, China's Huawei is also relying on its own R&D capabilities 
turning from a client of Huang to a competitor to some extent, not to mention all the others growing from around the world. And the semiconductor industry is facing an ever fiercer global competition. As a tech giant, certainly Qualcomm will have a lot of work to do. Let me go back to the three of you once again about this competition. Mm -hmm. Earlier we talked about one case, two cases involving acquisition about Qualcomm. It certainly shows us how politics is not necessarily helping businesses, mm -hmm. but rather the other way around. Now let's talk about business itself. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, you've got big politics going on with the Qualcomm company. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the competition is getting ever more fiercer. Mm -hmm. um, Andy, I want to go to you about that. Apple has already decided, next two years, no Qualcomm chips for the 5G thing. Rather, they want to use Intel, which is a big competitor against Qualcomm. Secondly, you also have Huawei and some of the other mobile phone companies having lawsuits against uh, Qualcomm from all over the world as a result of Qualcomm's patent and um, the, the way that it does business, where its cash cow is. So, uh, Andy, what do you make of this very mixed picture right now? Well, I think Qualcomm is certainly in a difficult spot because had the NXP acquisition gone through, it would have given them new sales channels, new products, new technical expertise. Well, they believe. Oh, no, it's just a fact. I mean, because NXP is strong in automotive and IoT. It complements their strength in traditional smart right. traditional smartphone market. So that would have been a source of growth because, as I mentioned earlier, the smartphone market is forecast to grow about 4% a year. These new markets might grow 50%, 60% a year. And uh, market valuation is all about right. earnings growth. So that's the problem they're facing. And now they're resorting to financial engineering to address this problem. So uh, Qualcomm is now engaged in a $30 billion share buyback yes. to raise the share price. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very negative signal uh, for Qualcomm. And it's a very negative signal, I hate to say, but for the future of 5G in the United States. Mm. Because when a company has to use its money instead of investing in new technology, but to buy its shares back, that usually is a sign that they don't have better ways to use their money. Mm. I, I, Professor Gong. Yeah, I also want to add a note that it's, it's not just about uh, market share. Uh, even the patents owned by uh, Qualcomm in the 5G standards, set of standards, is actually uh, largely uh, diminished compared to 2G, 3G, and 4G. Right. You know, Qualcomm has, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Huawei has a, a fairly you know, large a set of uh, patents that actually being uh, used, adopted by 3GPP for the uh, uh, 5G standard. So I think uh, the you know, Qualcomm is a company that derives a lot of revenues from from the re from the royalty side, and uh, with the uh, uh, the patent portfolio mm. a little bit uh, diminished in the, the 5G standard, I think that uh, that's going to have some impact on Qualcomm as well. So right. I think this company, but but, but don't under under look uh, Qualcomm. Qualcomm has had difficulties before. You know, I, I remember that I was in the telecom industry many many years ago. You know, I think at the time there was this battle in the U.S. between uh, uh, CDMA 3000 and that's GSM right. in the U.S. Yes, this is a long, long way back. You remember Qualcomm is a, that period of time. Yeah, that yeah. was a long, long time ago. And Qualcomm is a, is a company behind uh, CDM 2000. And it was a very, very difficult time for Qualcomm. Qualcomm actually, you know, bounced back and, mm -hmm. and, and did very well over the years. Right. So I think we shouldn't underestimate this company. It's, it's still a very good company, very well run company. You know, <laughs> our purpose is not to talk about one company or the other, but rather to use it as a case study to talk about the reasons. Yes. Uh, you know, economic and trade uh, environment that mm -hmm. we are talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the competition, mm -hmm. it is not just the high end, for example, uh, providing chips to Apple mm -hmm. uh, or the others, uh, you, but rather also the low end. Take, for example, um, Qualcomm's competitor, MediaTek. Media right. It's a far second with 20% and Apple 15%. That's according to research firm analysts. But the lawsuit with Qualcomm prompted Apple to abandon Snapdragon. It leaves Qualcomm as the most reliable chip supplier. And but with the record of resorting to political influence in business, uh, people wonder what it's going to be like, particularly with the huge competition coming also from the low end market. Yes. On that, I want to go to Professor Wolf about it. You see, if you, the company is being dragged by things, particularly political. It is very likely that the competitors are going to come up very soon 
and this is a fierce uh, competition market, shall we say, Professor Wall. Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Look, the recent announcement from Apple that they're going to use the Intel chip, which is actually a bit cheaper than the Qualcomm chip, just shows you that the uh, lower price competition is not simply uh, onshore, offshore, right? So Qualcomm, an American company, Intel, an American company, competing with each other on price. So it's not simply an international feature. It's a domestic feature of competition as well, which we should always remember. Mm. One. And two, I think the bigger issue here is what growth we do have in the smartphone space. And again, obviously you're looking at mid-single-digit growth, 5 6% at best for the smartphone units. Most of the growth is in the developing world. It's in places like India and Indonesia where price sensitivity is very high and where you can't expect people to be buying, you know, $500 to $1,000 handsets because the GDP per capita is only two and a half times that, right? That's so right. you're going to be looking at people who can make the most functional chip at the lowest price because the brain can't be more expensive than the market can pay for the <laughs> chip. So what growth we do have is mostly in the lower end. So you're absolutely right. Price sensitivity matters today. It will matter more tomorrow and more next year, especially as the smartphone becomes a utility technology, not so exciting, and it becomes a game about price much more than a game about features and cutting edge. Mm. So eventually, gentlemen, when we talk about the Qualcomm story mm -hmm. and the recent ups and downs, mm -hmm. what do you consider as the biggest takeaway for others uh, for this story? Let me go to you, Andy, first. Uh, very briefly from you. We only have uh, one minute and a half for everybody. So okay. 30 seconds for you. Well, I think it's a case study of how fundamentally the U.S. has changed politically and that the Trump administration is taking an active role in picking winners and losers or trying to pick winners and losers rather than having the market, the government be the referee and let the market decide. Got it. And Professor Gong. Well, I think uh, I think for in the telecom business, you know, it's always very special. It has a lot of politics involved here. It also has an antitrust aspect of it. So I think companies in that space have to be uh, weathering the, 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 the environment very carefully uh, in dealing with, especially when you have a business that's cross nations and uh, 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 you know global standard for 3G, something like 3G. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, the Professor Wolf. Yeah, so to me, if you want to be a global leader, you have to be world class. And the first world and world word in world class is world. If you shut yourself off from parts of the world, if you're fearful of other peoples and other cultures and other ideas and other companies, you cannot stay on top. And it would be as sad for, for many in and outside the U.S. for the United States to shrink in a, some fearful posture into right. its own borders and desert its chances at global leadership, technological and otherwise. Of course, here we want to thank the three of you for being with us, uh, John Gong, Andy Mock, and Max Wolf. And also, all the best to all the businesses, particularly those businesses that are doing uh, beyond their national borders. <laughs> thank you so much, gentlemen for being with us. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei, still to come on our program. Give me an example. Chinese economists, the lead of Wei, spells out what's next for China's economic reform right after this break. Ten million, okay. It's not the capital of China, nobody. Hello and welcome back to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. This year marks 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening up to the world, which has categorized the country's economic renewal. Since then, China has rapidly modernized its various sectors, increasing the living standards of the Chinese citizens. Today, the country is a top destination for foreign investment as it continues to open its markets and collaborate with foreign firms and governments. China will carry out a number of big measures to open up more and substantially relax market access, promote the development of the Belt and Road, and develop the first China International Import Expo. Earlier, I had a chance to sit down with Li Daokui, a well-known Chinese economist, and he frankly talked about the nature of China's latest challenges in pursuing reforms, but he also said that no one could halt the tide of reforms, because that's what all Chinese really see eye to eye on. We 
learn the news that some of the local numbers when it comes to GDP have been cooked for years, and therefore people put a question mark about China's exact growth rate. What about the picture now? Local enterprises are now given different sets of incentives. Before, they were pretty much um, simply motivated to, to have GDP, to, to have economic growth, to have faster GDP growth. Mm. Now, they are given a multi-task, multi-dimensional task. Uh, not only economic growth, uh, but more important, the, li the increase in living standard, mm -hmm. the improvement of the environment, and uh, R&D. Uh, so on and so forth. So I do believe that the local leaders are now very different. Mm -hmm. I've been traveling around in China I've s in recent months. Mm -hmm. I've seen tremendous change, tremendous change in the mentality of local officials. Give me an example, Professor. For example, I just came from a big, big uh, city in the province of Shandong mm -hmm. with a population almost 10 million. 10 million, okay? It's not the capital of Shandong, but it's one of the largest cities in Shandong. Right. And the mayor who invited me to go there. Mm. He uh, spends lots of energy and his uh, time to one topic. He's been also asking me about this topic, how to change the engine mm. of economic growth from simply making investments mm. in infrastructure to... Or real estate, to, to say the least. <laughs> to sustainable investments to prop up the local R&D. Mm. And also, he says, educated population. Therefore, the industry in the city will be able to upgrade. Mm. There has been concern whether countries, including China and others, there will be a rise of nationalism. So when you have pressure coming from outside, it's predictable nationalism would arise in the country. So how would that work eventually on the economic policies and on the way of reform? It's an interesting question, isn't it? If you look countries after countries in today's world, starting from the U.S., Right? President Trump. Don't you see that as nationalism? U.S. first, America first, right? As simple as that. But that has not been well received by the rest of the world, by the sure, way, Professor. But domestically, domestic, the, the president elected by the U.S. population, right? By the U.S. voters, is in, inward-looking, nationalistic. Mm. The nationalism is the trend of today's world. The Chinese government, including Chinese, you know, represented by Chinese leaders, right, are always, always trying to balance nationalism with a global commitment, mm -hmm. right? When, when President Xi Jinping says the China dream, he also says the common destiny. Mm. The community of shared future for all. Exactly. He always has double, two messages. The two messages are combined. Mm -hmm. That is, how to make China great again is through China being able to make more contribution to the rest of the world, unlike the past 500 years. In the past 500 years, not only China slowed down as a country in making progress, but also China slowed down as a country making contribution to the rest of the world. Mm. So today's message from China, I think, is super clear. Reform and opening up, that's what China has been embracing over the past 40 years. In fact, everyone in China has been benefiting from that. Professor Li Daokui is no exception. Professor Li is an also advocate of practice and has a story to tell about reform and opening up once asked about it. Take a listen. You are one of those products in a way, quote unquote. That is 40 years of reform and China's opening up, right? You were a Chinese student. And then you went overseas, you studied there in the United States, became a professor, worked there, comfortable life, but then you thought there's something better and bigger to be done, and you came back. You t teach at Tsinghua University, you try to establish the first ever institution on a Chinese university campus between Chinese and foreign, uh, in a way, joint efforts. So you knew how it was like to be someone coming from outside, coming back, and also to be a reformer in this process. The big takeaway from this 40-year anniversary of the reform is very, very simple. That is, continue the process and let the process not only benefit the Chinese people, but also the rest of the world. Reform is a mentality. 
truly reforms mentality every day in everything I have to implement the reform. For example, I've been teaching a course for 14 years, an undergraduate course. Every year I have to innovate and I told students if I don't innovate, if I don't do reform, somebody will, who is much more eloquent, much more knowledgeable, much more much better looking than myself. <laughs> we'll do I'm a not video sure whether that is the we'll we're talking about we'll do a video, we'll do a, you know, video, we'll do the internet learning. No, who am I? I will, I will be replaced. So that's why in my teaching, especially recent years, I always, always do reform. So in my current teaching, I reverse it. I let students first, rep first present the teaching material. Mm -hmm. I give them VBT beforehand and that make comments. That way, I believe I cannot be easily replaced. <laughs> so this is an example of reform. Not reform by artificial intelligence. Exactly. Reform is <laughs> mentality. I do believe that the, the reform as mentality is deeply, deeply rooted in China. But you also know the challenge of being a reformer. Of course. Because of course. you try to set up an institute on Tsinghua University campus, and it takes years. Yeah. And of course, you always encounter with challenges that could be part of the fun, you could argue, yeah. but at the same time, it is challenging. It's challenging because, number one, you have to be patient. Number two, you really, really, really have to think from the other people's perspective. You have to make sure potential losers are properly taken care of. Right? You can imagine, you might be a loser of, the, of any reform any process. Any reform. Right? You feel, you feel very uncomfortable. So any successful reform uh, has to, right, has to overcome the uh, obstacles from the, from the potential losers. And I, my belief is not to wipe them out. But Rather, they have, you have to find a way to make them comfortable. But is the baggage to too heavy? Well, reform, that by definition, is that we have a bigger pie. We have a bigger pie. We have a bigger, right, bigger economy, more efficiency. So we're, we should be able to afford to compensate the potential loser. Maybe it's a bad word. Potential, potential. Uh, uh, Those interests are people, being right? challenged. That's mm. right. Mm. But how patient can you be? Do well, you need to be as a reformer? In China, we have a saying that uh, 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 being slow is not a problem. The problem is to stop. Right? If you keep on moving, keep on, keep on moving you eventually will get there. Some example in Beijing traffic. If in Beijing traffic in a crossroad, if you stop, you never go cross because it's so busy. They are, they are, they are, they are bicycles, they are uh, passengers, they are right, pedestrians, they, they're always cutting our way, right? So what you do in Beijing's crossroads, if you, you have to gradually move, 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 right? Then people would yield to you. All right. You, if you run you too fast, you, you run too fast, you have accident. If you stand still, you never come across. Well, you ride a wonderful motorcycle in Beijing, so I would believe <laughs> you <laughs> what That's you right. have just said. Yeah. Looking ahead, it's not going to be easy, to say the least, Professor. And China will be in the water that it has never been before. So what kind of mes mindset, Professor, do you think? What is the leadership or the common folks, academics in China, from your perspective, need to have? Number one. And hold it dear. Number one, a sense of uh, urgency, a, a sense of um, um, uh, crisis, maybe too strong word, mm -hmm. a sense of needs uh, of continued reform. Mm -hmm. right? That's very, very important. Number two, be global. Always keep in mind that China is big enough, huge enough, so anything Chinese essentially is global. Mm -hmm. So we also have to take foreigners or uh, people in the rest of the world's interest into account. Mm -hmm. We have to understand their mentality, we have to understand their interest. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally I believe that China's growth, China's continued progress will also benefit the rest of the world. Professor Li, it's always a great pleasure having you on our program. All the best. My <laughs> honor, my pleasure. Thank you so Thank much, you. Professor. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside, CGTN, into your search engine, or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for Insights Across China and...
around the world. Good night.